Well, good morning, everybody. It's nice to be here. I'm doing something a little bit different today. I've got a computer for my notes. Don't ask me why. Okay, my printer was not working. I had printer problems this morning. Moral of the story, do not wait to the last minute, which Terry has been dying to tell me, but she bit her tongue the whole time here. So I'll say it. Don't wait till the last minute to print out your sermon notes. Okay, I'm done. No, actually, preparation would be a very good message. So I'm going to try something different. I have my computer notes. I hope it goes well. The good news for you is that this battery of my computer is a little bit old, and it might not last very long. So you might be spared a few minutes from the sermon if the battery goes dead. So it'll be, uh, I'll just have to wrap it up. I have my last scripture memorized, so we'll be good there. But I want to start, brethren, by asking a question. Just try to imagine someone that uh, is kind of difficult to get along with. I know we all have someone in our lives that we find might be difficult to get along with. Um, Maybe someone who maybe is just a little edgy sometimes or just rubs you the wrong way. Maybe they're kind of snappy from time to time. You know, you just talk to them and all of a sudden they bark at you a little bit. They're just, you know, maybe someone who likes to gossip a lot. I don't know. They're always talking about someone. You ever, you know, someone like that? Someone that likes to gossip. I think we all know people that, uh, you know, something that's hard for me is people that aren't sincere. You know, they're smiling at you when they're talking to you. And, um, but you have this sneaky suspicion that when they're off talking to someone else, they're not saying the best things about you, or they're just not sincere, they're not telling you the truth. You know, sometimes I'd rather people just, you know, tell me how they really feel. At least I know, you know. So I, that's something I have a hard time dealing with, people that, you know, you just can't trust. Another one, maybe you have a hard time dealing with people that are a little bit more self-centered than, you know, the average person. It's all about them. You know, the conversation always ends up coming back to what they're doing, how they did this. A little bit more too self-centered. Those are people that are just too busy all the time. They're so busy, they never have time for anything. I don't know if that bugs you. Now, as I'm going through this, I'm sure, I'm sure that some people in your lives have come to mind. If nobody has come to mind for you, raise your hand. Oh. (laughs) Did somebody in your life come to mind as I was talking through that? Some person that you've worked with, someone at work or in your family or friends or a neighbor. We all have somebody that's difficult to get along with, don't we? How many of you, the whole time I was going through this, were thinking of yourselves? Okay, maybe a couple. Most weren't. Most weren't. It's easy for us to always see what's wrong with everybody else, isn't it? It's easy to see what's wrong with the world. I watch the news. It's so easy to see that so much is wrong with everything around me. I get offended. I get irritated. Trials of life, dealing with people sometimes isn't always that easy, but how often or how hard is it sometimes for us to turn our radar that's so perceptive to ourselves. Throughout the day, when when we get into a challenge, do we first and foremost say, what did I do to bring this on myself? If someone doesn't treat us a certain way, do we say, why is that person being such a jerk? Or do we say, hmm, did I offend this person? What did I do to bring this on me? I don't know. You know what I'm saying? It's so easy to see everything wrong around us, but how hard is it, how difficult is it for us to really take a good, honest look at what 
we are doing, how we're living our lives, who we are. Is our walk in line with the talk? And we say a lot of good things. We talk a good talk. We know the truth. We keep the holy days. God has revealed to us the truth. Do people see something different about us to say, wow, what are you doing? I want to get some of that. King David said in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, search me, and know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. David was a friend of God. God loved David so much. Could this be part of the reason why? Because David wasn't saying to God, search the world, find all the problems in it and fix them because it's all screwed up. No. It's like that Michael Jackson song, you know? Look in the mirror. Look at the man in the mirror. I don't know how that popped into my mind. It just did. I like that song. It's a good song. You know, when there's a problem in the world, maybe the first thing we should do is do what King David said. Pray to God and say, find out what's, what's wrong with me. Where, where can I make an improvement? Psalm 26. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Prove me. Try me. Test me. Oh, that's a good, courageous prayer, isn't it? Praying to God that he tests us? How often do we want to say, God, just give me a comfortable life. <laughs> Don't try me. Don't test me. But you know what? What do we learn when things are easy? Think throughout your life. The greatest lessons in your personal life, did they come when times were easy? Probably not. As much as we hated going through those trials, it's the trials that make us who we are. The trials test us. Not only did King David have the courage to pray that God would show him his flaws, but he prayed that God would prove him and test him. Try my reins in my heart, is what he said. Try his heart. Proverbs chapter 14 says, The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. How many of us truly know ourselves? There's an interesting thing. When I took this personality test one time at work, pretty interesting test, we had to a answer questions you know, a hundred and some questions, and then the results said, here's how you perceive yourself. That's interesting. And then it had another thing. Here's how others will tend to perceive you. You mean, how I perceive myself isn't how others will perceive me? Yeah. That's a fact of psychology, well-known fact of psychology. We want to project a certain self, but... You know, who we think we are isn't necessarily what people see. Sometimes that's a good way to examine yourself is to say, not what do I think I am, but if I gave a survey to 10 people around me, what would they say about me? Maybe that's the real way to examine how we're doing. Because Christianity is about having impact, isn't it? It's not just about us sitting in our, in our room and studying the Bible and being all perfect. It's about getting out in the world and, and interacting and having an impact on people's lives. So, you know, why did I pick this topic? Well, I mean, we just went over the Holy Day calendar. Passover is right around the corner. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 
because Passover, you know, sometimes, I mean, one of the things I know I can do better is not have the holy days sneak up on me. All of a sudden, it's the holy day, and oh, I've been so busy with work. I've got to get the leaven out of my house. Hopefully, we can get out ahead of it just a little bit here. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll break in at verse 24. Now here the Apostle Paul had an issue with the way the Corinthians were keeping the Passover in the previous verses. But then he references here in verse 24 of chapter 11, 1 Corinthians, and when he gave, when he had given thanks, he's talking about Jesus, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. So he broke the bread, gave it to the disciples. Now Paul is saying, and after the same manner also he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament. Testament is just another word for legally binding agreement. He took the new legally binding agreement in my blood. This do you as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. So that's what Jesus said was the Passover. Paul is saying to the Corinthians, for as often as you eat this bread, verse 26, and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. So here Paul's reminding us that the Passover isn't about his resurrection. The focus is on his death. His death. Whenever we keep the Passover, we show the Lord's death till he comes. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. In other words, there's some way that we should eat and drink this cup. There's something that we should be thinking about. There's a certain way that we need to prepare ourselves before we go into the Passover service. Because if we go into the Passover service with the wrong attitude or somehow what, what Paul's describing is unworthily, then we are guilty, what does this mean? Guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. I think it means that it's like we killed Jesus ourselves. We were there saying, kill him. We're guilty. And then Paul says, but let a man examine himself. So this isn't about examining others. It's not about looking out in the world and watching the news and getting all upset. Right now, this time, brethren, is about turning inward, looking inward inside of ourselves, honestly, objectively, in a tough way, taking time to do it. We don't have time to do anything anymore. We should make time. You have to make time. This is what Paul's saying. Before the Passover, let a man examine himself. After you've successfully examined yourself, then so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For that he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself. I don't think any of us want that. If he does it unworthily, so part of being, what does it mean to drink unworthily? It's an indication here, not discerning the Lord's body. What does that mean, discerning the Lord's body? It means understanding and reflecting and meditating on what Jesus actually went through. It's not just some story that we read. Try to put yourself in Jesus' Jesus's shoes. Imagine what it would be like for you personally to be persecuted Without cause. You're innocent, and yet people are trying to kill you and destroy you, hit you, spit on you, call you names. So part of preparation, of examining, examining ourselves, is understanding that we have to discern the Lord's body. We have to understand and meditate and think about what Jesus went through. 
And then Paul says, for this cause, so some that weren't doing this preparation work before the Passover, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep, many have died. So there are consequences, brethren, for us not to prepare properly for the Passover. This is serious stuff. There's real effects here. We need to take it seriously, brethren. We need to make time and prepare, examine ourselves, discern the Lord's body. Verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, no, Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged. It's easy for us to judge everything around us, to judge other people. Here, Paul is saying, don't do that. Judge yourself. Judge yourself. Paul says, if we would judge ourselves, then we should not be judged. If we do the job of judging ourselves, God will not have to judge us. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to be on the wrong side of Christ, to be judged by God. So why don't we take it on ourselves to do the hard work, the tough work of judging ourselves honestly, having a real hard look of how we're really doing as Christians. But when we are judged, if God does have to judge us, the last verse here that I'm going to talk about in 1 Corinthians, we are chastened of the Lord. So all these trials, the sickly, you know, those that are sick and weak, those that sleep, kind of referring to being chastened of the Lord. So, But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So God loves us so much that when we're not judging ourselves, he'll judge us for the purpose of chastening us, teaching us how through trials. I take this to mean if we want a life maybe with a little less trial, maybe we should judge ourselves a little bit more candidly every day. We should be our own toughest critic. Because when we're our own toughest critic, God doesn't have to do all this work to mold and shape us. We're doing part of that ourselves. He says, if we don't want to do that hard work, guess what? He loves us enough to give us some tough love. So it's in our best interest, brethren, to put our ego aside and to examine ourselves. 2 Corinthians 13 says, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Don't take it for granted. Being in the faith just isn't about showing up for church on Saturday. There's work to be done. God expects results. I'm going to go through that a little bit of that in in a little while. Prove your own selves. Prove it. Test yourselves. Maybe sometimes, brethren, we should put ourselves through a trial for the express purpose of proving ourselves, of molding our own character. Maybe having the courage to say, I'm going to just jump into this. I know it's going to be tough, but I'm going to do it. Maybe this person that I thought about originally that's difficult to deal with, maybe that's my trial that I'm going to put myself into. I'm going to see if I can work it out. I know that it's going to be difficult. Let me give it a shot. Get out of my comfort zone a little bit. (coughs) Prove our own selves. Know you not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobates or void of judgment. So in other words, I think Paul is saying here in 2 Corinthians, you have the Spirit of God in you. Don't be afraid to get in some tough situations. you got the power of God in you to help you work it out. So brethren, that's what I want to talk about today. How we should be thinking about ourselves how do we examine ourselves before the passover what does this mean whether we're in the faith do do we have god's spirit 
God says, don't quench the Spirit. What does that mean? What does it look like? Are we quenching God's Spirit? Do we have evidence of God's Spirit in us? Are we making improvements? How strong is our faith? Are we sure that we're in the truth? Are we a real Christian? Do we value the things that Christ values? Are we showing the personality traits that God wants to see in us? Do other people see those traits in us? Are we growing as Christians or have we pretty much kind of stayed the same last year? Did we make improvements through the year that we can look and see? Did we regress? Do we think, wow, you know, a few years ago I was really into it. Boy, have I slipped. It's okay if that happened as long as you recognize it. The worst thing would be is if you're oblivious. Then Satan's having his way. So I want to start, before we get into examining how to examine ourselves, I think the first thing, brethren, is to start with what is our goal? Maybe before we go there, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. I mentioned that God expects results. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. We'll break into the text. Actually, I'm just going to read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 17. Here Paul says that the man of God should be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I keep going back to this word perfect because I always look at that as what we should be striving for because nobody's perfect, especially not us. If you examine yourself and say, you know what, I can't really see my sins that easily, okay, well, you need some work in opening up your mind and taking a harder look at yourself because when you get good at it, brethren, after a while you start to say to yourself, man, I am so screwed up. <laughs> I got so much work I got to do. That's not a bad thing. We should be joyful. We should know that God's with us. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. So here Paul's talking about the ministry, church, the leaders in the church, different gifts that he gave different, different members of the church. We all have talents. We all have gifts and a reason for being here. Why? Verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. Because God's mission, the reason you're called, you ever wonder why God opened your mind and brought you into this truth, into fellowship with God's people? Right here. For the perfecting of the saints, because he's trying to perfect you. He's trying to make you perfect. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure and of the stature and fullness of Christ. That, brethren, is the mission that God has for you. I talk about a mission in life. Okay. You go out and ask a hundred people, what's their mission? What's their goal in life? Most of them are going to come back and say, to be a good father, good husband, good wife, a good mother, to get a college education, to have a good career. I don't know, you can list it. Think about what are the things that, that people endeavor to do in their life. We set goals. If I say, what's, the, what's your mission in life? Most people are going to say these things that have to do with this life. But here we read that Jesus' mission, the, the mission of the church, is to bring each and every one of us to the fullness and stature of Christ. To be perfect. 
in all of these different goals in life, let me ask you, how many of them are going to transcend this life? Are the things you're spending your time on going to transcend this life? I'm putting a ton of time into my job, I'll tell you that. I spend a ton of time in my job. I'm working hard. I see some results. It's good. I'm blessed. Thank God I'm blessed with a good job. How much of the things I'm doing in my job are going to transcend this life? Or are they going to die when I die? What is your mission in life, brethren? I think having a good self-assessment is to squarely understand what is our mission. Isaiah chapter 22, 13, we can read, And behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen, killing sheep, eating flesh, and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. Isn't that the attitude of most people in the world? The Apostle Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32, If after the man of men, if after the man of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage, what advantage does it give me if the dead rise not? If there's no afterlife, if there's nothing after this, then let us eat, drink, and be merry. But see, we know differently there is more to this life. Ecclesiastes 12. Turn with me over to Ecclesiastes 12, verse 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Just turn there. Here, King Solomon... the author of Ecclesiastes, is summarizing his wisdom. Verse 12, verse, or chapter 12, verse 1, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when you shall say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In other words, he's saying, look, life is going to have trials. When you're young, everything's great. But you're going to go through some tough times. You'll have your trials. Drop down to verse 6. Or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain. He's talking about our lives being broken, brethren. This is talking about when we die. Or the wheel be broken at the cistern. There will be disappointments in life, but ultimately, verse 6, we're going to die. It says, verse 7, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. All the things that we did in our lives, all the accomplishments, it's going to be turned to dust. It's going to be turned to dust. Do I remember what my great-grandfather did? I can remember his name. I don't even know what his career was. That's just my great-grandfather. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Interesting scripture about what happens when we die. Our spirit goes back to God. The Bible also says that the dead know nothing, so we're a disembodied spirit. It's like a tape recording. God's going to hang on to it until he gives us a new body. Verse 8, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanity. All these things that we strive for in this life are therefore vanity. What does vanity mean? It could mean arrogance and pride. It also means worthlessness. 
relative to eternity, if something's going to dry up and go back to dust, then it's kind of pointless. Why do we go through all the things we go through? Is it to, to win the wrestling tournament? That's something I have to struggle with sometimes. My kid's in wrestling, and it's like I'm totally living through him. I admit it. I used to wrestle. I want him to win. Oh, that's so awesome. Is that the reason? To get the, the victory? Or is it the journey? Is it what you learn along the way? Vanity of vanities. All is vanity, says the preacher. All is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out, and he set order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. That which was written was upright, even the words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads and as, as, as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further, by these, my son, be admonished. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. Fear God. Have a, a, a reverence, a respect, an awesome respect for God, and keep his commandments. What an awesome way to summarize the duty of man. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Brethren, what is your mission in life? Is it to do all these things and accomplish all these things? Or is there something that we are we're doing this because there's a greater purpose? What was Jesus' mission? 1 Peter chapter 1, I'll just read it and then we'll turn to John. 1 Peter chapter 1, 18, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, we're not redeemed. Jesus didn't redeem us with worldly possessions from your vain conversation received by tradition from the, your elders, but with the precious blood of Christ as of the Lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Jesus was ordained before we even existed, before the world existed, to come down and suffer what he suffered, to give his life for us. Turn with me to John chapter 17. I imagine we will read this scripture again in a few, couple weeks or at, at Passover. But this is such a beautiful, beautiful statement that Jesus makes. I want to talk about his mission. His mission was to save us. His mission for us, you can see it here in John chapter 17, verse 19. We'll start. Here, Jesus is praying to the Father. Right before he's going to go through his trials his persecution. And he says to the Father, and for their sakes I sanctify myself. It's for them that I'm doing this. That they also might be sanctified through the truth so that they would be saved also. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So Jesus is praying for all of us that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. There is so much in there, brethren. Jesus' last words before he was going to go through his trial, praying to the Father, it's to say, I am separating myself. I'm going to go through this for those that believe on me through the word. And the reason is because I want them to be in us the way I and you are together. The relationship that me and you have, Father, I want them to have the same relationship with us.
Verse 22, And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. Going back to this goal of perfection, perfecting us. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved me. So there's a witness that has to go about this, part of the mission of Christ. As you have loved me, Father, I will, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am. Jesus wants us to be with him. That they may behold my glory. Jesus says we cannot look at him in his glory until we are spirit beings just like him. We read that when we're resurrected, we will see him as he is. Jesus wants us to be born into his family as brothers and sisters, powerful spiritual beings, to enjoy what he has, to be like him and to have what he has. It says, which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. Here, this is Jesus' mission for us, brethren. This is why we're born. Yes, we are to be good fathers and mothers. God wants us to be good brothers and sisters. To be good co-workers. But the reason he wants it is because he's trying to build in us the character of, of love, of godly love, to be like Christ so that he can welcome us into his family. That's the whole purpose and mission. Once, brethren, we get that in our mind that everything we're doing is because we're to build character. Yes, let's, let's strive to get a PhD if that's something we want to do. We want to go to college. But not for the sake of the PhD, but because it's hard. Didn't John F. Kennedy say that? It's one of my favorite things that a president ever says. We don't go to the moon because it's easy. We do it because it's hard. Challenge yourself. Be the best you can be at work. Not to get that promotion, but because you're going to learn how to be a good leader. You're going to learn how to get stuff done. Because God wants people that know how to be good leaders and know how to get stuff done. We're doing it to glorify God. We're doing it to be the best we could possibly be. We're developing our character, our skills, our traits so that we can be good children, helping to bring about peace and prosperity in the world when the time comes. That's the purpose, brethren. That's our mission. So how do we go about evaluating whether or not we're in line with this mission? Well, the first thing, brethren, is we have to study. We have to understand who Jesus was. We have to understand how he interacted with the world, how he dealt with trouble and tribulation. We have to understand his personality. I'm not going to go through all of it, brethren. I'm just going to go to Romans chapter 12 and reference it. Romans chapter 12. Let's just go there, read this quickly. And then I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to write in your notes Matthew chapter 5. Read about... The Beatitudes, Ephesians chapter 4, the fruits of the Spirit, Titus chapter 2, Colossians 3, if you want to study before Passover, take some time, read those chapters, Colossians 3, Titus 2, Ephesians chapter 4, Romans chapter, or Matthew chapter 5. Let's just turn over to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We'll break in in verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. In other words, let love be without favor. Love everybody the same. Matthew tells us to love our enemies. Hate that which is evil. Join up, cleave to that which is good. Be kind, kindly affectioned. Have affection for people kind affection for one another, with brotherly love, in honor, 
preferring one another. I'll tell you, brethren, nothing makes me feel better than when, when we're at a restaurant and every once in a while the kids behave. And someone might say, as they're getting up after they paid their bill, they walk over and say, I just want to tell you, your kids were very well behaved. I'm just sharing that because it happens every once in a while. Wow, does that make me as a dad feel so proud. Talk about kids honoring their mother and their father. That's how you honor mom and dad. Okay, how do we honor God? Does anybody go to pray God, thanking God for us? Saying, God, boy, I'll tell you, you must be working with Dave. Does that happen? Honor, preferring one another, not slothful in business. Are we lazy sometimes? Or are we hardworking? What would our coworkers say about us? Fervent in spirit. We still have that zeal that God that, that had that we had when we first came into the church? Serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. Are we joyful? Do we rejoice every day? Or do we complain about all the things that are wrong? Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of the saints. Are we giving people? Given to hospitality. Do we make time to spend time with people? Or do we just kind of do our own thing? Bless them which persecute you. Wow. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Have empathy with people. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not the high things, but condescend to the men of low estate. Are we humble? Or do we have pride and arrogance that pops up from time to time? Brethren, if we want to evaluate how we're doing as Christians, these are the scriptures that we have to meditate on. Ephesians 4, read those and meditate on those. Challenge yourself. Ask, do, is there examples in my life can I think of things that I've done over the past year that would say I'm doing these? Or can I think of things where I absolutely fell on my face? I made mistakes. If so, be honest. Confess those sins. Ask God to help you overcome them. The second thing, brethren, is are we keeping the commandments? 1 John chapter 3.23. Let's just look there very quickly. 1 John chapter 3.23. And we'll break in. I'll give you a second to go there. First John chapter 3, verse 23. And this is the commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandments. So we have to be loving each other. And He that keeps His commandments dwells in Him. So if you want to know if Christ is in us, if the Holy Spirit is in us, brethren, then we have to be confident that we're keeping God's commandments. Okay. So we have to assess ourselves before the Passover. I can't think of a better way to assess ourselves than read through the commandments and see, are we keeping the commandments? So I said that I had printer problems. So I'm going to apologize. I only have 20 copies. I can email this to you if you want. But I printed out a sheet here. A little survey. I don't know if the, you want to zoom in here. The first one here, I'll go ahead and just pass that around. It says, preparation for Passover. Self-assessment. And it lists, I went through these scriptures that I referenced, and I tried to pull out the best I could some of the traits that God says we should be modeling in our lives, showing people. And I, I put a question up here. It's not how would you rate yourself. The question is how often do others see this trait in you? Because James tells us it's not about what we think. It's about what people see and feel. It's about the work that we do. 
Don't show me my, your faith without works. Show me faith by your works. So, how often do people see this in you? Love without favor. Even our enemies. Never, rarely, sometimes, almost always, or always. Joy. How often would others rate you as a joyful person? Always? Sometimes? Take time. As you read through these scriptures, go through this and try to do an honest assessment. Pray about it. Say, ask God to give you a clear mind. Show, like David said, show me my sins. Prove me. And then go through and do this rating. You don't have to show it to anybody else. Maybe afterwards shred it or keep it until next year and see if you've made improvement. But use it as a tool to do an assessment. Do other people see these traits in you? How would they rate you? And on the other side, brethren, I have the Ten Commandments. I tried to find a corollary commandment in the New Testament. And then I have examples here for you could write some examples. Reflect on your life, brethren, and say, over the past 12 months, since last Passover, have I done anything that would kind of exemplify this first commandment, putting God first in my life? Is there anything I can point to, good or bad? Maybe your example is, boy, I really failed here. I put this other thing before God. Write it down. Sometimes when you write it makes it more real in your own mind. Write it down and then challenge yourself. What can I do to improve over the next year? Because isn't that really what the Passover is all about? Examine yourselves. And then God's mission. We're striving, working to be perfect. We can't be perfect if we don't improve every single day. So here's an example. I just want to share a couple of these. The first commandment, I'm the Lord your God who have brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Then Matthew chapter 22, verse 7, Jesus said unto him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. I found it very, very helpful to kind of connect the New Testament commandments with the Old Testament commandments. Thou shalt not make any graven image. What's that about, graven image? Well, the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 12, 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably and reverence, with reverence and godly fear. To me, the second commandment is about having a relationship with God. Don't worship him through some physical idol. Connect with him and have reverence for him. Thou shalt not take in the name of the Lord your God in vain. That's just not about the word GD. What does it mean to take God's name in vain? Joshua chapter 24, verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. Are you sincere when you pray to God? Or are you just doing some rote prayer that you do every night or every day? How real is it? Are you worshiping God in truth? And you can go on. Hopefully this could be a good example for you, a good tool that you can use to evaluate yourself before Passover. How are you doing? What are some examples? What did you do well? What, do you, what did you fail in? And what can you do to improve? Make a, you know, this is the new year. This is God's new year. We talk about a New Year's resolution in January. Well, that's what the pagans do. I want to work out. I want to lose a few pounds. This is the New Year's resolution we should be making, brethren. This is a commitment to yourself. Passover is a recommittal to walk with Christ. So write a few things down here. Commit to yourself. Do this before Passover. Passover. And there, then when you're eating the bread and drinking the wine, you're thinking about, I said I was going to be a kinder person. I said I was going to be more patient 
when I get tested. I told myself I wouldn't be so easily offended. I told myself I'm going to make more out of the Sabbath day. I'm going to try to do something more with my family to make it a more joyful day than just coming to church. Whatever it is for you, write it down and make a commitment with yourself. This, brethren, I think, if I might be so bold to say, would be a very good way to start getting your mind around how do I examine myself and make sure that when I take the Passover, I'm taking it discerning the Lord's body and I'm taking it worthily. I'm, rever I'm, I'm reverencing it. I'm making a real commitment. I've evaluated myself. I'm, I've examined myself. I know where I'm weak. I know where I'm strong. And I've made a commitment, at least in these few points, to make a real improvement next year. I would venture to say, brethren, that that's exactly what Christ wants us to do for the Passover. And the whole point of the Days of Unleavened Bread is to search ourselves and our, our, our character to remove the leavening, brethren, the pride. I want to talk about pride just for a second, and then I'll wrap it up here. Pride is such, such a destructive force in our bodies, brethren, in our minds. Pride gets in the way of so much. It promotes jealousy, closed-mindedness, envy, arrogance, conceit, selfishness. Pride will prevent us from doing an honest assessment. Ask God to humble you before you do this. Try to remove the pride and the ego. It's okay, brethren. God says we're all sinners, every one of us. It's okay to admit that we're wrong, that we did something wrong. It's better to be honest and, and, and get it out in front of you so you can work on it than to bury it and ignore it. Remove the pride. And finally, brethren, the last thing to do is develop a real plan. You know, a marathon isn't run with one step. It's thousands and thousands of steps. God has patience. I believe is even if you pick one thing, one single thing that you're going to work on, and you set it as a mission in the next year to work on that and make an improvement, well, guess what's going to happen next year when you do this? You'll be able to say, hey, at least in this one area, I made an improvement. Thank you, God, for the help. I think God will be pleased. Hey, you made an improvement. Now go to the next thing. After two, three, four, it's like paying off your mortgage. It's like I'm never going to pay this thing down. But after five or six years, ten years, you start seeing you're making progress. Paul said that this life is like running a race. Don't give up. Persevere. Keep going. Just make an improvement every single day. We're commanded by God, brethren, to examine ourselves. It's a critical component to Passover. We have to do it if we're going to take the Passover properly. We're to search and prove ourselves. We're to prove our actions. We're to see if we're measuring up to the fullness and stature of Christ. I dare say we won't be, but it's okay. Find out where our gaps are and put a plan in place to improve. Ask God to open our minds, to give us the courage to, and honesty and humility to prove our faith, understand where we're weak. Pray to God to show us our sins. He'll also, I guarantee you, I, I believe this wholeheartedly, He will give us what we need to overcome them. He'll bolster us up. He'll allow us to have joy even when life is tough. The self-assessment is the most important assessment of our lives, brethren. Ask the tough questions. Prove your faith. Lay out a plan for next year. Take it seriously, brethren, and it'll be, it'll result, brethren, in a deep and meaningful, valuable Passover.
the Passover will be one of the best things you could experience if you do it that way. It'll be a way to recommit to Christ. And you'll have confidence that you've humbled yourself and that God is with you and that he will be with you as you go through the coming months and years. So please, brethren, evaluate yourself honestly. Have a great Passover.